You are matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. You are faithful. All creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and broken. You are comfort for every heart that moans. Our King, our Savior, forever for eternity we will sing of all you've done for eternity we will sing of all you've done we sing God with us God for us nothing can come against no one can stand between God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Your heart, it moves with compassion. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. We Where there was death, you brought life. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. On behalf of myself, our associate pastor, Rachel Callender, the staff, the congregation, we want to say thank you very much for being with us. We want to say a special word of welcome to those who are joining us online today. Uh, especially on this uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're really grateful that you've come. And uh, we take this time, and we will, so, uh, we will do so during the service, to recognize the sacrifices of those who have gone before us uh, to make us who we are. Now, today's message uh, that's going to be uh, preached by Pastor Rachel in just a little bit is about how sometimes the Spirit leads us not in the paths of least resistance, but into sometimes the paths of uh, the most resistance, and how we have to be open to the Spirit's leading in that direction. So if you are online, I hope that you'll take a minute, that you'll check in uh, on Facebook uh, with us, that you'll make a comment. Let us know that you're there. We hope that you'll share the stream. You can also uh, take a minute here in the room. We're going to be coming around with the red attendance pads, and I hope that you'll uh, share with us your contact information, especially if you're visiting us with us, maybe for the first time. We would love to be able to keep in touch with you and let you know about things that are going on here at the church, so we hope that you'll give us that opportunity. You can do the same thing online at medfordumc.org slash online dash attendance. And uh, you can get there also through the app. And if you haven't downloaded the app, we encourage you to do that. You download it and you receive a daily devotional. Uh, you can catch up on your worship content, manage giving. And uh, that's real easy to do. You text Medford app, all one word, 833-700-2226. And if you'd like to make a gift today to support our ministry, you have um, we have the offering baskets here. But you can also, again, use the app. You can visit our website at medfordumc.org slash give. Or our mailing address is 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. So first, a couple of important announcements. We want to celebrate with Pastor Rachel. You see that she's wearing a stole, which is the sign of her office. Uh, this week, Pastor Rachel was ordained in the United Methodist Church. She is a full elder. And uh, that happened on Tuesday. And this is the culmination of years of hard work. It is not easy to be ordained in the United Methodist Church. And it represents uh, also the culmination of generations of family tradition. Um, Thirteen elders in your line, is that correct? In the calendar line, 16 if you add my grandmother. Oh, there's even, okay, understood. <laughs> so 13 within the calendar family, 16 if you take into account um, the other side of the family. So amazing. And so we celebrate with you and with all your family. And secondly, as you know, Methodist clergy are appointed for a year at a time. And at the same annual conference, it was announced that both Rachel and I will return uh, to the Medford United Methodist Church for the 2022-2023 appointment year. So we're happy about that. <clears throat> We thank you uh, for your love and for your care and for your support. And Rachel, can we offer a prayer for you and with you? Let's pray together. God of all grace, we thank you for our friend Rachel. We thank you for our pastor, Rachel. We thank you for um, the calling that you've placed on her life, the clear gifts that you've given her from ministry, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on her. And we just pray that the blessings that you have poured into her life will follow her for all her days. We're grateful for all the ways in which you have blessed her up to this day. We're grateful for uh, her upcoming marriage. We give you thanks for Matt. And we just pray every happiness for her as she continues to serve you in the church and in the world. God, we give you thanks for her. And pray for her in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Rachel. God bless you, Rachel. I have a couple of other announcements that I want to share with you this morning. Um, so first of all, we're going to also be celebrating graduates next week. And so if you have a graduate in your family, um, we hope that you'll submit those names to the office uh, no later than uh, Tuesday morning, uh, the 31st. And then finally, we want to share with you, we know that you have um, friends and family, children, grandchildren, and we are excited to be offering a Vacation Bible School again this year, and that's going to be taking place uh, with a new format at a new time. That's going to be on July the 18th to the 21st from 6 to 8 p.m. in the evening, and so registration opens on uh, May the 30th. We'll put that up on our website. We'll share it on Facebook. We'll send it out, and uh, we would love to see your kids, your grandkids, uh, your neighbors, and that's a program that's going to be open for ages four 
uh, through rising fifth graders, okay? And we'd also, if you have older kids, we would love to have their help as well. Um, they help us as crew leaders starting in sixth grade, and so we'd really be uh, very much appreciative of you taking some time to think about children in your life who might want to get involved with this. I can tell you um, from my own uh, daughter's experiences that it's not just fun to be part of the program, it's also fun also to lead others in the program. So we would love to have your help in that. So I think uh, those are all the announcements that I have. If you'd like for more information about Vacation Bible School, you can talk to me, uh, you can talk with Rachel, and uh, talk with Bethany Carl. So I'm going to lead us in a moment of prayer. And so I'll invite you uh, just to take a moment and uh, join me in this opening prayer that we're going to put up on the screen. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, engulf this space of worship with your bright light this morning. Move through us, enlivening us to be your hands and feet in the world. Amen. Nate, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's wonderful to worship with you together. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able, and we're going to sing together.
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear, my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love my fear it doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love my fear it doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love Amen. I'd like to know if there's some uh, young people who want to come and join me here this morning, and uh, we have a little Bible story to talk about. So good morning. How are you? Good to see you. You're a long way away. That's okay. Hey, good morning. How are you? And good morning to you at home, too. Is there anybody else who would like to join us today? So, we have a very famous story today, okay? So, today's famous story is about, I got to move a little closer to you, okay? Is about two people named Paul and Silas. Do you, have you ever heard the name Paul before? Have you ever heard the name Paul before? A guy from the Bible? So, there was a guy named Paul, and he was a preacher, right? So, he told people about Jesus, and he and his friend Silas, they were traveling around and they were talking to people about Jesus. But not everybody liked the fact that they were telling people about Jesus. Okay, And this kept happening to them. People would sometimes get them in trouble because they said, you shouldn't be talking to people about Jesus. Okay, And so one time, Paul and Silas found, found themselves arrested and they were in jail. Okay, Now, have you ever been in jail? No, no, I haven't been in jail either. I visited jails, but so Paul and Silas were in jail, and they were in jail because they told people about Jesus. Now, it was the middle of the night, and they were in jail, and their feet 
were in what they call stocks. Have you ever gone to a place where they had like, it was like an old timey place and they had the little stocks that you put your head in? Have you ever seen that before? No, it was like a way that they used to punish people. Like you put your head through this thing and your arms through this thing and you were supposed to stay there like that. Well, they also had those for people's feet so they couldn't get up and they couldn't move and they couldn't get away, right? They were just kind of stuck there like this, right? Right? But they were praying. And they were singing, okay? So they were praying and they were singing all night. And the other prisoners were listening in. And then all of a sudden something happened. There was this big earthquake that started, right? What does an earthquake sound like? Can you help me? Right? There's this big earthquake. And then suddenly their chains broke. And the doors came open. Now, what do you think happened next? Right, they could have gotten out, but it's interesting that they didn't actually. They stayed there. And the jailer was thinking, oh, everybody's got to be, I think everybody's got to, already left, right? He came, the guy who was in charge of running the jail, he came, and he was looking around, and he was thinking, oh, Everybody's left already. I'm going to be in so much trouble, right? Because he was afraid everybody's going to escape. But when they got there, Paul said, no, we're still here. And they didn't leave. And what ended up happening was the jailer saw everything that had happened and said, God must really be powerful. God must really be amazing. God must be able to do some awesome things. Why don't you tell me about Jesus? And so Paul and Silas ended up having dinner at the jailer's house, and they told him about Jesus, right? It's a really, really surprising story. Surprising because it starts out that they're in jail, right? But they don't leave the jail, and instead what they end up doing is going to dinner at the jailer's house, right, and telling them about Jesus. So one of the things that I think is important about this story is it tells us that God has the power to do some pretty amazing things in the world, right? And it happened because they were praying, okay? So can you uh, pray with me right now? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that our prayers are powerful. And we thank you that you can do amazing things in the world. If we trust you, absolutely, bless you. God bless you. Absolutely. If we trust you and we pray to you and we know that you're at work in us and through us and we trust you to do great things in the world, we hope that you will always help us to pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. It was good to see you today. Have fun. I think that in the back is somebody to take you maybe to hang out with. No? There's Mrs. Carl. She's there. So I was going to say, she disappeared just for a second, just around the corner. So Mrs. Carl's in the back, if you would like. She has, I know that she was making some coloring packets today. Joe just told my whole story now. Spoiler. So today's reading is Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day when we were on the way to the place for prayer, we met a slave woman. She had a spirit that enabled her to predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners through fortune telling. She began following Paul and, and us shouting, these people are servants of the most high God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation for you. She did this for many days. This annoyed Paul so much that he finally turned and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. It left her at that very moment. Her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone. They grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the officials in the city center. When her owners approached the legal authorities, they said, these people are causing an uproar in our city. They are Jews who promote customs that we Romans can't accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attacks against Paul and Silas, 
So the authorities ordered that they be stripped of their clothes and beaten with a rod. When Paul and Silas had been severely beaten, the authorities threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to secure them with great care. When he received these instructions, he threw them into the innermost cell and secured their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All at once, there was such a violent earthquake that it shook the prison's foundations. The doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer awoke and saw the open doors of the prison, he thought the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword and was, and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted loudly, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for some lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He led them outside and asked, honorable masters, what must I do to be rescued? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. They spoke the Lord's word to him and everyone else in his house. Right then in the middle of the night, the jailer welcomed them and washed their wounds. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his home and gave them a meal. He was overjoyed because he and everyone in his household had come to believe in God. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Holy God, we invite your spirit to lead us this morning, putting ourselves aside. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, God, now and forever. Amen. What was supposed to be a two-hour-long lunch meeting with colleagues to commiserate about the struggles of COVID pandemic church life turned into a five hour long, spirit filled, spirit enlivened back and forth about radical communion bread. Very exciting, I know. Now I, as someone who can't eat traditional bread, have a lot of thoughts on this subject. So I come at it from the point of view of a person with an invisible disability that makes it so I can't eat gluten. This idea of communion being accessible, the, the, those with disabilities don't have to chase people down to find out if something's gluten-free. The fear of entering a new space, hearing the words that Christ has invited all to his table, then realizing that there's nothing for me at the table. It's fair to say that I have a lot of passionate opinions about this subject. The per this perspective alone has been a hot topic in ecumenical circles for a while, with a lot of great contention between different denominations and different churches. And we in this group, we talked about that. We talked about the allergy debate of Eucharist, along with other shocking different spirit-led choices in performing communion. We talked about a couple years ago how the Reconciling Ministries Network performed communion at annual conference and I remember the flutter of joy that I felt go through me when the pastor stood up there and broke the bread. And there, inside the bread, were just all the colors of the rainbow neatly stacked. And you can just hear the audible gasp because no one had ever seen the body of Christ expressed in this way. And one of the pastors in the group posed us with the option with an option that had been weighing on her heart for a while, something that she felt that the Spirit was leading her to do and her to challenge her own congregation with. She had been considering using something like maybe a dark rye bread for communion instead of a more common white wheat bread for the body of Christ. And she wanted to know how we thought people would react, if at all, right? And of course, we enthusiastically chatted away about the theological implications of that, the visual statement on diversity and what Christ's body is and what it looks like, and how we get stuck in doing something one way because that's how everyone else does it. That's how it's always been done. To be fair, I can't eat wheat or rye bread, so that wouldn't help me at all, but it's not really the point of the story. The pull of the spirit is often leading us to step out of the norm, out of the expected. It's often challenging us to be willing to put ourselves out there to ask questions like, is this working? 
Will the inevitable resistance of others stop me from doing this thing that the Spirit is leading me to do? It could be really scary, but it can also be really rewarding. It's not uncommon for people, particularly when influenced by the power of numbers and the power of fitting in, to not be beating by the drum of God, but by, to be beating by the drum of social pressure. And in fact, sometimes the Holy Spirit, it isn't drumming at all, right? The Holy Spirit's got a piccolo and is trying to do a woodwind solo while everyone else is in the front ensemble pit area, right? There will be opposition to the Spirit's work. There's no way around that. But there will also be God's provision for a way forward in the face of that opposition. We see in today's text how there are a lot of moving parts. There even, you may not have caught it, I'll point out this time, there's even a dragon in this story, um, which I was really hoping the Spirit would lead me to talk about that this morning, but that wasn't what the Spirit wanted me to talk about, I guess. But the text is ultimately about a trial. See, our author Luke tells us of a time where he was with Paul and Silas and others evangelizing, out telling their story, teaching people about who Christ is, and they were looking for a spot to pray, and this often happens that someone's looking for a spot to pray, and that's when something kind of crazy and unexpected happens. And so while out, they came across a slave woman, and she was making money for her masters by fortune-telling, basically. And apparently she was really good at it because she was making a lot of wealth for those who owned her. And she was following around this group, Paul and Silas, and Paul got fed up with her prophesying, her being exploited for money. So he put an end to it in the name of Christ. Now the Greek word used for the spirit that is inside of her causing her to, to do this, to do this uh, fortune telling, is best translated to the word dragon, which is pretty wild. Um, but I don't want you to get lost in how abstract to take the idea of Paul's exercising a dragon spirit, right? The bare bones of this story here is that we have a marginalized woman being used for the gain of others, and Paul stops it. Well, as you can imagine, those making money off of her were not thrilled that Paul did this. But notice, though, that what they are angry about is their money lost due to Paul. But when they drag Paul to the officials, that isn't what they accuse him of. And why? Because they know that they wouldn't get the backing that they needed by the crowd if they were came in like, hey, we were making money off of this woman being manipulated and this guy stopped it. Can you like arrest him for doing that, right? They realize that they would look bad in that situation. So they do exactly what modern day fear mongering on social media looks like. They feed into the prejudices and biases of the crowd that they are in. This crowd would have backed Paul for helping a woman, but anti-Semitism was common in this area. So that, so that is the button that they decide to push in order to get what they want. They say, these men, they're Jewish in religion and heritage and culture and beliefs, and they are trying to put those customs on us? No. That anti-Semitism, the racism that runs rampant through our culture today, look how deep those roots are. Jesus had only ascended to heaven a few chapters ago. That anti-Semitism existed as far back as the New and the Old Testaments. Just read the book of Esther, right? So that's their fake argument. Getting the crowd mad about who Paul is and his sharing his beliefs that differ from theirs, which, according to the law at that time, was not against the law. Without any sort of defense or questioning, Paul and Silas were arrested, beaten, thrown in jail, where their jailer was told to secure them, which he does. So here we introduce someone who just does as they're told, doesn't question right or wrong, being exposed to the profound ministry, the spirit-led ministry of Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas, with their feet tied up in jail in the jail cell, do exactly what all of us would do in the exact same situation, they start to sing. And they begin expressing their trust in God through song, and it acts as its own sort of evangelism to the other prisoners. It doesn't say anything beyond the fact that these prisoners, who were probably in jail for an assortment of different top things, 
They were simply just listening to their song, listening to their prayers. Here, the prison acts as a metaphor for the dark, sad, lonely places in life and how even in those places, a witness, a song, a prayer to the spirit being at work can transform lives, can break people free, can liberate those who have lost all hope. And this is where we get our theater moment, the duex machina, that moment where all seems lost, the plot seems unresolvable, but in comes God. The spirit loves a dramatic entrance. There's an earthquake and the prison doors fly open and the chains around their ankles break loose and they all proudly, backed by the roar of God, are no longer imprisoned, yet they do not leave. This is very important. You would think, logically, that they would get out of there, right? But the Spirit's telling them, no, still got work to do. When the jailer realizes that all the prisoners that he was in charge of have escaped, he wants to harm himself. But Paul is still there to stop him. And in those days, something like an earthquake, um, those kinds of things were often taken as communications from God. So it was likely that this jailer understood this moment of the earthquake, plus him failing to do his duty as a divine judgment and a statement on his salvation being lost. But Paul is waiting. Spirit-filled Paul is waiting to offer the jailer a different message, one of redemption and resurrection and transformation. One that doesn't just do or believe what the crowd does, but is willing to step out of line and put itself out there, willing to just wait in a jail for the jailer to come back and who knows, right? The jailer has a conversion moment and is told something very similar to what we heard to last week's text, that he and his whole household can be saved through Christ. And this one story we've had Freedom in Christ found by so many different kinds of people, the slave woman, the prisoners, the jailer. The spirit through Paul has reached so many different kinds of people. And the jailer then takes on the role of a servant that the prisoners once had by washing their wounds. He gets baptized. He invites them into his home to break bread, to share at the Lord's table where the sacrifice, pain, and suffering of Christ is remembered as an act of stepping out of the crowd for the redemption of others. Because of the spirit, he does something that he and his household had never done before and finds new life in Christ. The world has had enough of its habits. It's had enough of its crowd following for the sake of blending in. The spirit wants to work through each and every one of us today. It wants to fire to catch within us. It wants to witness to the power of hope in the dark and lonely places of this world. It wants to free the marginalized, and it wants to break some radical communion bread. Let us come to God in prayer. Dearest Lord, your spirit has tried to be at work so many times, and we haven't listened. We've talked ourselves out of it found others to talk us out of it, not allowing your spirit to challenge us to step out and speak up even if there's resistance. Forgive us. This day, move your spirit through us so that we may live bold, new lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Friends, as we uh, move into these busy summer months, today might be the right time for you to uh, do something to make a difference in the ministry of the church, and that is uh, by setting up recurring giving in uh, using your bank account, using your credit card. It's easy, it's convenient, it's a great way for us to be able to continue to fund the ministry of the church uh, through the summer. Maybe you can even earn points back on your credit card if that's something that uh, you receive, one of those perks. But this simple step just helps us to be able to provide for the kind of a continuity of uh, funding for the church during the summer. And you can even do it you know, while you're down the shore in your beach chair. It's a very simple thing um, to sign up. You can uh, open our app. And if you don't have the app, again, you can download it by texting Medford app to 833-700-2226. You can also visit us on the web and set it up there at medfordumc.org slash give. So we thank you very much for your gifts. We're going to take some time now uh, to go to God in prayer, and as we come to God in prayer this morning, our thoughts obviously turn uh, to the victims of the recent massacres at Robb Elementary School, but also at the top supermarket in Buffalo. So even as we make plans to be with family and friends for the weekend, we remember those who will not be with their loved ones. And in particular on this weekend, this weekend that is sacred to the memory of those who gave their lives in service to this nation, I pray that together we might build a society that's worthy of their sacrifice. I know that there are many among us who are not only grieving, but also feeling despair and anger I am tired of hearing that we should just accept this. 
the idea of seniors being shot in a grocery store because of the color of their skin, or kids being shot in a school because, let's face it, a child is in possession of a weapon that's so deadly that even trained officers feel powerless in the face of it. It's just not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. And so we offer our prayers to God this morning for new hearts and new minds and new ways of thinking. And we pray trusting God to receive all of the pain that we carry in our hearts. So this morning, let's begin with a moment of silence. God, you know those whom we grieve today. You've called each of the 31 victims by name, just as you've called each of us by name. You know their families, you know their friends, you know their hopes and their dreams. You know that their lives mattered and you know that they deserved better. We pray that their deaths might spur us to action and not to spare. Inspire us to pray and to work for communities and for a nation where all lives are valued and all can live in peace together. On this weekend of National Remembrance, we give you thanks for those who have offered their lives in service to others. We recognize that the wars we fight are not without cost or consequence. And we pray for leaders of this nation and all nations that they might seek peace with one another for the sake of young lives put at risk. We offer our prayers for the peace of the world today and especially for Ukraine that violence might end and that its people might know the fullness of life. We also ask you to intervene on behalf of those who are closest to us, people whom we love and whom we care for. And I invite you now, uh, whether you're online, whether you're here in the room, to lift those names now. John and for Nancy. Finally, God, we would fail to honor you unless we also gave thanks for all that is good in our lives. We thank you for the blessings of the springtime. We thank you for family and friends, for graduations and weddings, for time spent at peace, doing the things that we enjoy. We celebrate with Pastor Rachel today, and we give you thanks for her ministry. We ask your blessing and anointing for her as she follows this calling that you've placed on her life. We pray all this and more in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite you to lift your voice with us as we sing glory to God. Please stand as you're able. me. 
to let the Spirit guide you. Go ready to replace excuses with a firm yes to God and go sharing the open grace we experience at the Lord's table with everyone. Go in peace and go with God. Amen. <laughs>